Hello, everybody. I'm Julie Passarelli. I'm the Exhibits and Collections Curator here. Welcome to our Discovery Lecture Series. Um, I'd like to introduce someone in the back. We have our librarian, Cecily Thomas. Yay. Yay. She has a lot of really cool uh, articles, um, a lot of them written by our speaker and some cool books, um, and a, a, a library pathfinder that you guys can take home that has um, literature um, all based around the lovely Grunion that we're gonna be hearing so much about tonight. So it's my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Karen Martin. Dr. Martin is a distinguished professor of biology and the department chair of natural science at Pepperdine University. She earned her doctorate in biology at UCLA, go Bruins, and did a postdoc fellowship at Friday Harbor Laboratories at the University of Washington. She has published three books and over 50 journal, journal articles and book chapters on coastal ecology, amphibious fishes, and the vertebrate transition from water to land. She co-founded the Beach Ecology Coalition, a nonprofit organization to bring together beach maintenance workers, ecologists, lifeguards, and resource managers to maintain human recreation and wildlife conservation on sandy beaches. She also co-founded co the Grenion Greeters, a citizen scientist group that provides data on Grenion populations. This group has worked with aquariums, environmental groups, government agencies, and coastal cities and counties. <laughs> She received the Environmental Partnership Award from the American, America Shore and Beach uh, Preservation Association and the prestigious Conservation Achievement Award from the American Fisheries Society. The title of tonight's talk is Surf, Sand, and Silver Sides, Research and Outreach with the California Grunion. Please help me welcome Dr. Karen Martin. Good evening. Thanks for coming out here on a Friday night to talk about Grenion. So I always like to know who I'm talking to. So first of all, is there anybody here that's ever seen the Grenion before? Oh, this is so great. Is there anybody that has ever tried to see the Grenion but didn't actually see any? Uh-huh, okay. <laughs> you have to keep trying. You have to keep trying. They're out there. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, and it, oh, I also need to ask, was anybody here Monday night at that great run? Couple of you, maybe? Good, okay. <laughs> um, the Grenon is one of the most fascinating animals in the world and it can only be seen here in California. So we're so fortunate to be at a place like this where they celebrate this wonderful animal and have a public program so that more and more people can learn about it. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what I do with the Grenon and uh, we'll see if we can tell you some things that maybe you don't know already. So I know you guys know a lot. All right, so here are some of the things we're gonna talk about today. What is a grunion? How does, it, how does beach spawning affect its life and its development? Um, where are the grunions spawning? Are there other fish that do something like this? And what can we do to protect them? Okay, and I am a college professor, so at the end of the talk, <laughs> there's a quiz, and your grade depends on it, all right? So. In a world where fish come out of water, one species stands between life and death. One species, one spawning habitat, one moonlit night. It's a story of how far one fish will go for love. Leaving the sea in droves, they risk everything in search of passion. Surf, sand, and silver sides, California. Yeah, the Insect Surfers is a, is a local band, and Gary Moore is the KLOS uh, DJ on the afternoon, so Southern Californians all. Uh, okay, so that we do have a movie, sorry, we do have a movie that, uh, trying not to do that, okay. Um, we do have a, a video about the Grenon that's called Surf, Sand, and Silver Sides that that was a trailer for, so it's on our website and um, sometimes shown in this very room, so that would be something you can see more of if you want to. Um, as everybody knows, the big thing about grinding is that they're defined by the tides. So we have big high tides on the new moon and on the full moon. And in between, the tides don't get quite so high. And so what this graphic is showing us is that their, their spawning event, which is the thing that we all know, 
is timed to the highest tides right after the newer full moon. And then their eggs are in the sand, out of water, sitting there in the beach for the entire period of their incubation. It's a very strange thing for a fish to do. And then the next time the tides come up will be the next new or full moon two weeks later, and that's when they will hatch. Pretty fascinating way to live their lives. So here, actually Beth is here tonight. <laughs> and this is her video of a grenadine. So that's the grenadine's body, the female in the middle, all dug in, lots of males around her. Not for very long. Love them and leave them. <laughs> She's okay with that. <laughs> Coming out. Hard work. And they're out of water. You can hear the waves in the background, but these are fully out of water. And here's those beautiful, wonderful eggs that are going to be the next generation coming out. So thank you, Beth, for that wonderful <laughs> picture. So here's a picture of the same beach at low and high tide. Here's that high tide. This water's coming all the way up here. And that rock is just sticking out a little bit. And here's that low tide. And that's how big that rock is. It's, it dwarfs those people walking on the beach. So that's a big difference between a low and a high tide. So if you think about the granite putting their eggs up this part of the beach, at the highest tide, they are really going to be out of water. They're going to be out of water, and there's going to be dry sand above them during the period of time when they're incubating, which is a really critical time in their life. They, they don't have any protection from predators. They can't get away. They can't do much except to grow. <laughs> so you might imagine that uh, this would be a troublesome place, but it is actually a good place. You, this is why they do it, is because it's good for them. So one of the good things about it is that there's plenty of oxygen. If you're out of water and you're in the sand, Oxygen is going to diffuse down to those eggs really easily. They're going to be able to get plenty of good uh, oxygen for their metabolism as they develop. And it's also um, warmer out of water, especially with the sun shining down on the, on the sand. It might be warmer than it is in the ocean, so they will develop nicely and quickly. They'll be ready to go when the next tides come up. So those are the two main advantages that we would say. Another one that you sometimes hear is that they are away from aquatic predators. Okay? A lot of fish eggs are very tasty for a lot of aquatic predators that are in the plankton or crabs or other fish. If they're buried in the sand, they're not, those things are not going to get to them. So that's great, but there have got to be some disadvantages. Um, imagine <laughs> if these eggs didn't get buried, if that fish flopped out and left those eggs at the surface, as sometimes happens, what's going to happen to those eggs the next day when the sun comes out? And they're going to be cooked. <laughs> that's right. You're going to have boiled eggs. So, uh, so that's a disadvantage that they might dry out. They might get too hot. They might uh, be exposed and not safe. Normally, they would be a few inches below the surface, and they'd be in damp sand. And it's so a nice, safe habitat. But if they get exposed, it's very not safe. So that's one disadvantage. <laughs> Another disadvantage is that there are some predators that do actually come to them in the sand. So there's some worms, some beetles, and some birds that will come after those eggs in the sand. So that's another disadvantage. And then another disadvantage would be, what if they're ready to hatch? What if they're ready to hatch and they hatch in the sand? They can't swim and they can't feed and they're gonna get crushed. So that would be a disadvantage. So think about that. This is all the problems that these little things have to solve in their first few days of life. So how to get through that. Runyon runs are timed by the cycles of the tides and can be predicted. Tides are based on interactions among the sun, the moon, and the Earth's oceans. The highest tides correspond to what we see as the new moon and the full moon. In other moon phases, the tides are less extreme. The Grunion take advantage of this when they come ashore to deposit their eggs. The embryos mature as the tides fall and leave more sand to protect them. About nine days later, the tides rise again, releasing the fully developed embryos into the waves, prompting them to hatch. The cycle begins again after the next new or full moon. During the grunion season, the highest high tides are all at night, so that's when the grunion run. Okay, so again, probably most of you guys knew that, right? Because you're here at Cabrillo and they make a big point about this is when we schedule the grunion run programs is at the high tides, right? That's when the grunion are gonna run. So here's the trick. This, is a, this graphic at the top was, uh, was, <laughs> was put together by Boyd Walker. You heard his name mentioned earlier. Boyd Walker is the grunion guru. Um, he's the one that figured out this timing of the spawning of the grunion that we all depend on now. And so that's from his doctoral dissertation that he did in 1949, <laughs> quite a while ago. Um, and you notice that where the, where the bars are on top of those kind of sine waves, that's when the grunion were running. You also notice that between the new and the full moon, 
those tides don't get quite the same height. And so they're running on some tides that are lower and some tides that are higher. So if you think about them putting their eggs in the sand here, one, one of those higher tides, then two weeks later, you can imagine that if the tide doesn't get quite that high again, those eggs might not get back out again. So they might be stuck there longer than those two weeks. So one of the things that I do with my students <laughs> is, is go check out eggs. I'm really interested in the, this early development period. And so we go dig them up with little shovels, kind of like this little plastic shovel. No, we actually don't use that little plastic shovel. But um, what we're seeing here is there's some older eggs and some new eggs. These are the orange ones, they're brand new. The older eggs are kind of a darkish color. They're, they're transparent. These are exactly at the same tidal height. So somehow, they're smart and they know where they're supposed to be running, okay? They're not running at the highest of the high tides. They're running as the tide goes out and they're picking where they wanna put their eggs. And so we just took those eggs and hatched them out because we felt sorry for them. We're like, you, you missed it, you missed it, you know, you gotta get out. So we hatched them out and let them go. <laughs> but these actually could stay in the sand longer than just those first, that first two week period between the, the newer full moon. So um, what we found, and Beth is one of the people that found this, <laughs> is that they can live up to about 30 to 35 days longer, and that's actually not just one tide beyond their normal hatching time, but actually two tides beyond their normal hatching time. Not as many of them will live that long, but some of them will. So it's a, they're, they're able to do that, um, to survive an extended incubation that's either double or even triple the normal amount of time that they would take to develop and be ready to hatch. So let's think about that hatching a little bit before we think about how they do that. This is a picture taken here. We're hatching out granny dings, all right? So what does this mean for hatching? So our hatching is very special here. This is another student of mine that made this video. So we're gonna see the, the early development of the granny and all the way through hatching. And she did a study to try to understand what, what the actual events at hatching were. So we're going out to the granny and run. You can see the, again, females digging in, and males around them. Um, very nice run. <laughs> and then they're leaving their eggs behind, and so we're going to see those eggs start to develop. So again, you can see that they're clearly out of water during this whole time. I know a lot of you have seen this in real life, right? But for those of you who haven't, they really do come out of water when they uh, develop. Here's the egg developing. When it first starts, there's a bunch of individual oil globules, and then as time goes on, these consolidate into one large globule. So you're seeing within a, a very short period of time, up to about three days, they're actually consolidating. You can actually see the outline of the fish here now. See his eyes? Here's it all consolidated into one nice globule. It's moving a little bit, and you can see the eyes really well. And you can see the heartbeat if you look carefully. Up here is the heartbeat. You can see it up here. The heartbeat, okay, this one's just about ready to hitch. It's, it looks pretty well developed, so we're gonna see if this one hatches, okay? So let's watch. The heartbeat. And so what she did was she shake them up, put them under a the microscope, and start the videotape. <laughs> it was actually videotape back then. <laughs> um, and there we go. We get a little deformity of the egg. And then it's out. <laughs> so that's real time. That's really fast. So most people that studied uh, hatching when I first started, we first started working on these, they couldn't believe how fast it was. And of course, you guys know that. You've seen it here. But uh, other fish don't do that. Other fish take a long time to hatch. Um, and there's another one. So she did 87 of these. So I guess this is going to take, no, we won't watch all 87 <laughs> um, But you can see this one is going to be, you can see that deforming of the, uh, of the chorion. What happens is that they release an enzyme. It's called a hatching enzyme, chorionase. And that causes a weakening, a weakening spot in the chorion, in the egg envelope. And this is slowed down frame by frame. So now you see that this embryo is rotating. The tail has the hatching glands. Push out that tail. And now it's out. So this is 60 frames per second, so that's how fast it is. It's less than a second for it to pop out once it has that um, hatching enzyme going. <laughs> it's amazing. So here's, uh, <laughs> here's a close-up of the side of the little baby larval, or actually embryonic grunion. And there's these little tiny dots here. These are the hatching glands. They're actually single cells. Um, and they're full of this enzyme. And so what happens during hatching is that this enzyme is released and it uh, is activated and it begins to break down the chorion and then they pop out. We know that the um, embryo is active in this process. The embryo actually decides to do this and come out. So we know this because if we um, anesthetize the embryo and shake them, they don't come out. 
okay? And then if we uh, let them recover from the anesthetic and try it again, they pop right out. And if you look at their sides, after they've hatched, these hatching glands are gone. They don't have them anymore, they've used them. So when they're twisting around and twirling around like that, this is what Tara found with her study, um, they're moving that hatching enzyme around on the chorion and then they, they cause a split to occur and then they can get out. So there's a current study that's looking at um, some um, immunofluorescence to try to understand more about the actual lo localization of the enzyme. So this is what we call an environmental cue for hatching. And this is something that the grunion have. You have to tell them, or the environment has to tell them when it's time to hatch. So if they're in the water, like a normal fish, a boring normal fish, they develop a regular time, and when it's time to hatch, they hatch, and they begin, become a larva, okay? But <laughs> if they're cool, like the grunion, <laughs> if they get into the water when they're ready to hatch, they will hatch. If they don't, they won't hatch. They will stay in embryo for as long as it takes. When the aquatic conditions arrive, then they'll hatch. If the aquatic conditions never arrive, they never hatch. They never hatch. That's very, very, very unusual. Um, it's really hard to find another animal that does that. Most animals will hatch, even if it's a terrible environment, just because. Whereas granny are like, no, I'm waiting till it's right. Which may not be the best choice sometimes. Okay, interesting thing, the larval stage will begin. What happens while they're sitting in that egg during this period? This is, oops, sorry, this is something I wanted to study uh, and learn more about and with a group of other students. So this is what happens, not a whole lot. <laughs> um, here's a one that's ready to hatch. It's what we call the primary hatching period right after the first tide. And um, it looks great, <laughs> it's hatching. Here's one that's 25 days post-fertilization. DPF stands for days post-fertilization, days after the grunion run. Um, so this one, more than twice as long of an incubation, it looks the same. If you looked at its mouth or its eyes or its fins, they look the same. They haven't developed very much at all. There are a few things that are different. These pigment spots are bigger. Um, there's a little bit more, the otolith, which is the bone inside the ear that shows the age, gets bigger over time. So you can actually age these things and you'll know if you've got older ones or younger ones. Um, but otherwise, they don't really change very much. So they're metabolically active, though, this whole time. So it's really interesting. So you, people say, well, they go into a metabolic arrest. They just kind of like hunker down and they stop growing and they stop using energy. But that's not the case. They're active. You can look at their heart rate. The heart rate is the same. They're using energy the same way. They're just stopping their growth. They're stopping their development. So it's kind of like an arrested development, really interesting phenomenon. Really interesting. All right, so here's that early study. Um, here's the, the change in the metabolism. I'm not gonna show you very many graphs tonight, but I have to show you a few. <laughs> change in metabolism during that early period of development, and then once they reach hatching competence, ready to hatch, they basically level off. They don't really change that much um, in their metabolism. It just kind of stays steady for the rest of the time. It does not go down. They don't stop breathing. They don't stop being active. And so what that means is, for me as a researcher, or for you coming to a program, anytime you want to hatch them out, you can hatch them out. They're ready to go. Anytime. Okay? They don't need any time to prepare. They're ready. So that's pretty nifty. <laughs> this is the size of the yolk, though. This is what happens to the yolk. As time goes on, that yolk gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, if they don't get um, hatched by about 30 days or so, it's too small and they can, you can still see them alive. You can still see their heart beating but they, can't, they, they don't have the energy to get out of the, uh, the chorion anymore. They can't hatch anymore. All right. So what do we know? We know that they have both behavioral and physiological adaptations for hatching. This unique environmental cue, which is the shaking in the seawater that we've all done, very unique. There's no other animal that really does that. Um, rapid emergence, extremely rapid. Once they get ready to hatch, they go. And then they can actually double or even more the original incubation period, which delays the start of larval development. So what happens is that once they hatch is that they start going into their larval development. So grunions start to feed the minute they hatch. If there's food available, they'll start eating. And they start growing right away. They grow pretty fast. They don't grow while they're in the egg. So if you hatch one out after 25 days and one after 10 days, they will grow at the same rate. They will eat at the same rate. So it's, once they start larval development, it's fine. They do fine. It's really interesting. 
that they can do that. All right. <laughs> So that's, it's kind of a, it's a disadvantage that you have to wait for the environmental cue to um, hatch, but it's an advantage that they're able to wait and they, they get that little extra time if they need it and they're able to come out even if the environment doesn't cooperate every time. All right, another, <laughs> another risk of spawning on the beaches is the birds that can come. So I know you have some of these birds here at Cabrillo Beach as well. well this is, these are pictures taken at Malibu Beach near my university, Pepperdine. And uh, so here's a great blue heron. Here's a black crowned night heron up here. These guys come out at night and they feast on these grunion. They just walk up there and pick them up and eat them like nothing. Like they, they have a great time. <laughs> so we noticed this. We started watching them and we decided that we should see if they were there on nights when the grunion were not there because we were seeing them when we would go out to watch for grunion. So we went out a lot of nights when they weren't there. We didn't expect a grunion run and we didn't see any birds. <laughs> and so the only night you see the birds there at night is when the grinding runs are expected. And so we started going out, we'd look for the birds, and we'd go, oh, the birds are here. That means the grinding are going to run tonight, right? <laughs> and we figured the birds were looking at each other going, oh, the people are here. That means the grinding are going to run tonight. <laughs> Sometimes they did. All right, um, here's, our, here's what we saw. So here's the night of the newer full moon. And then right here, you see that they're out. And then after the run is over, they're not. They're smart. <laughs> In fact, they were out even when the, even when the grunion did not run, they would come out. They were there before the fish got out there, and they were there on nights when the grunions did not run. And so they were actually more reliable <laughs> than the grunion. They would, they would almost always be there, and the grunion would not almost always be there, as I'm sure you've noticed. <sighs> All right. Um, but anyway, they're fun. They're fun to watch. There's a lot of other predators on grunion runs, some of which you may have seen here. Sea lions and dolphins and other mammals come out and eat them. So little baby is very happy to have a good meal like that. Um, guitarfish come out. Uh, smooth hound and uh, leopard sharks will chase them. Now, this one actually is coming out on the beach. As the wave comes up, this, these, these uh, will ride up on the wave with the grunion and chase them right out of the water. Uh, this is a squid, a Humboldt squid, and these Humboldt squids um, are occasionally are seen on our shores and they do chase the grunion. They can't figure out how to get back into the water again, so it's that, that's the last thing they do, but, um, but they do do that. <laughs> All right, so then, so they have, so, so anyway, so basically, you remember at the very beginning it said risking their lives, you know, be, between life and death, they're, they're coming out of water, right, which they literally are risking their lives to come out of water like this. Um, what happens the next day? So remember we said that one of the reasons why they might come out of water is to avoid aquatic predators. But there are predators <laughs> in the uh, terrestrial environment as well, and here's a few of them. So this is uh, taken in Los Angeles, right by Playa del Rey. Uh, bird, bird people <laughs> who sent me these pictures. The very next day they go, do you think there was a grunion run? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I think maybe there was. Um, so anyway, so a lot of shorebirds will come in. This is a very mixed flock of a lot of different species of shorebirds. And let's see if we can get this short. That's what it looks like. <laughs> so do you think the granny ran, ran there? Yes, they did. So there's a lot of really good food for these Have you ever been birds. to Lake Hodges? Um, so here's what it looks like. You see these little holes where the birds' beaks went in and they get a bunch of eggs. And you see that they just really hammered the site. They went and got a lot of eggs, a lot of birds <laughs> feeding, right? And that went on for several days. Usually when this happens, this is, it happens like right after the run, the day after, and then maybe a day or two after, and then they don't do it anymore. So apparently what they're doing is they're seeing if there's a big run, there's sometimes little orange eggs on the surface and somebody finds them. And the other birds see that and they all come in and they enjoy it. But um, otherwise after that, they, they kind of stop, even though the eggs are still there. <laughs> all right, so I went out with my little trusty shovel to see if there was any eggs left after, a, after an event like that. And there actually were quite a few eggs left. So there's the eggs right there, right at the level that they should be. If you think about where the birds' beaks are going, they're going about down this far and the eggs so a lot of the eggs are much deeper than that. So luckily, even though the birds are getting food, I was able to get quite a few eggs. So I usually put up little flags when I get my eggs. <laughs> you can see that there, there are quite a few still left. So what this tells us about the birds is that we have one set of birds at night, preying upon the adult grinding that are coming up on shore. 
We have a completely different set of birds like these coming out the next day, preying upon the eggs. So we have a lot of birds getting involved here. <laughs> So I, as, a, as a biologist, I have to admit that there are some people who don't like fish as much as they like birds. They like birds more. I don't know why. Some people. <laughs> but anyway, to point out that they are, each of these is a really good high quality food item in spring and summer, which is when the birds are breeding. So it's a really critical time in their lives as well. Um, so this is something that we say, you know, we want to encourage <laughs> conservation of the natural resources because they have a food web, a natural web, that is interconnected with a lot of other organisms. So, all right, <laughs> a little ecology there. All right, are there any other fishes that do this? Okay, so this is pretty spectacular. When you see a big granny run, you probably never forget it, right? It's pretty impressive. So the question is, are there any that really do the same thing? So you will see a couple of examples here. This is, a, this is the Gulf grunion, Laurasis sardina. Same genus, different species. And this is daytime. This is video by Don Thompson, who did a lot of work on these fish in the 1970s, and they're out in the daytime. This was done on April 4th, so almost exactly the, today, but a few years ago. Um, they come out of water in the daytime because the tides there in the Gulf, at the very top of the Gulf of California, um, in the, at this time of year are in the daytime instead of at night. They do also run at night when the tides are at night. You can imagine that <laughs> There might be birds preying upon them. So this is a picture somebody else took more recently uh, showing the birds coming in to prey upon that run. That's terrifying. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a Hitchcock movie, right? <laughs> so it's poor Grenin. Um, all right. And then there's also people that prey upon them. So you can see that's a pretty good run, but a lot of those are going to get taken by the birds and the people. Um, this animal, animal, this Loresti sardina, is actually listed on the IC, IUCN red list as a near threatened species because of habitat loss and other concerns, including climate change. Um, these are right at the top of the uh, Gulf of California. And if you can imagine, as time gets warmer, as the climate gets warmer, this is going to be tough on not only the adult fish, but also on the, the embryos or the eggs that are out on the sand. As that gets hotter, it's going to be harder and harder for them to survive to uh, hatch. So that's one, is a congener, the same genus, different species of grunion, so that, sure, they do that. Here's another one, it's a little different. <laughs> this is a capelin. Um, this is a fish that occurs in Canada and Alaska and Iceland, so Anna Olafsdottir is from Iceland. Take this in video. And they call it capelin rolling. You can see why. <laughs> it's pretty similar to what we see with the grunion, but they're not really out of water, or they might accidentally splash out of water, but they're not really necessarily trying to get out of water. There's not a lot of wave energy here either, as you can see. It's a very different environment from what we see. Also, a very pub pebbly beach, a pebbly beach. This is a really important fish for a lot of reasons. This is actually the fish that they feed to the whales at SeaWorld and all the, the captive sea lions that you see is the capelin usually is the one that they catch because there's a lot of them out there. Um, and they do this beach spawning thing. <laughs> it's pretty neat. Um, and they also spawn on, in subtidally, which we don't think the grunion do that. We think the grunion only spawn on beaches. But these guys also spawn subtidally, but they spawn on beaches, but not predictably. So I've put in the moon phases just so you can see they're not really coordinated with the moon. They're coordinated with something else, and they're harder to predict. So what happens is when they run or when they roll, if somebody sees it, they call everybody else. They all run out. <laughs> but you can't necessarily get there in time to see it if you're trying to time your visit. If you don't live in the area, it's a little tough. So here's a case, a case we have a triplets. We have two males and a female that will come ashore as triplets, um, and she'll lay her eggs. Um, what it looks like, they're in gravel. They're in a gravel beach, and then this is the eggs, little tiny eggs, smaller than granny eggs. Um, I've seen these eggs, and I haven't seen a capelin in real life, but uh, a run, I mean, but I have seen the, the eggs in real life, and they're tiny, tiny little things, and they're stuck onto, like glue, onto these uh, rocks and gravel and seaweeds, and they will, they will hatch when it's time to hatch. They don't, they don't have the, the ability to delay their hatching the way that granny do. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that they do that's different is that a lot of them die after their run. So people come and harvest them from the shore, and a lot of animals do as well. 
Um, Grunion don't do that, <laughs> thank goodness, most of the time. But these guys, most of them, at least the males, will die after the run. All right, so that's another one. It's a smelt, it's not a silver side like the Grunion. Um, this is a Blenny, it looks terrifyingly huge here, but it's a tiny little fish, okay? <laughs> um, but this is an interesting fish because it spawns completely out of water. So what it has is it has a rock, like a big boulder, and the female will come up here and lay her eggs holding on upside down, tiny little fish holding it upside down, laying her eggs in sort of a one layer uh, on the top of the egg and then of the rock, and then the male will come along and fertilize it and then guard it and protect those embryos until they're ready to hatch, which is pretty nifty. <laughs> um, so we have about, as far as we know, about 21 different families of fishes that have some kind of beach spawning of various types. Um, for those of you who are fish people, I know there are some fish people here tonight. These are a small list of some of those 21 families. There are more. Um, some of these only have, in the whole family, only one uh, species that actually has a beach spawning habit. So I'll give you an example. This is the genus Takefugu, which is the puffer fish from Japan. It's called the grass puffer. There are 25 species of puffers in the, of, of this one genus, Takefugu. Um, only one of these spawns on beaches. This is the only one that does. It's so cute, right? <laughs> um, so I'll, parenthetically, I will just say, a lot of people say, well, do they have any special adaptations for being out of water? Speaking about the grunion, do they have any special adaptations? Do they walk on the land? Do they breathe air? And you're, you, know, you know the answer, no, they don't. They don't breathe air very well, and they don't move around real well. They can go, they can move, but they can't, they're not real coordinated about it. Same thing with these guys. They don't really look like they're made for being out of water at all, and yet they're putting their eggs there. So here's what that looks like in real life. One female, about 25 males, <laughs> all rushing into the shore, and they're coming in at the very highest tide. They're not really out of water. They're just right at the water's edge, and she's laying her eggs. Now, here's a really interesting thing. The eggs are toxic. So puffers have toxic ovaries. They have this tetrodotoxin. So the eggs don't have to be hidden from predators, right? So why are they putting them up here? <laughs> it must be good for them, right? There must be some good reason. So they actually, um, a Japanese uh, researcher was, was looking at these. He put some of the eggs up where they normally spawn, and he put some lower, and they actually do, did better lower in the way that he, where he put them than they did way up here. Then more of them survived. But what happens is that the male puffers will eat the eggs. So it's cannibalism. <laughs> So that may be what's driving this particular species to put their eggs out of water. So we have 21 different families, again, some with just one species um, that do this. Here's an <laughs> here's a example of some, of, these are what we call the ones that are experimenting, okay? These guys are experimenting. These are not only just one species, but one population within that species that are spawning on the beach. So one chum salmon population in, uh, in Alaska, one white stickleback in Canada, and one little flatfish in, in Washington. And the only ones of that whole species, the only populations that are spawning on the beaches. So it's kind of an interesting behavior that we see. It's kind of a plastic behavior, a behavior that we think can change over time. Another thing that we see with beach spawning fishes is that they are associated with particular substrates. So grunion in the sand, capelin in the gravel. These are a couple that are uh, on rocks, like the the little blenny, and this is a, actually the toadfish. Um, this is putting eggs on a um, vegetation, and that little fish has got a clutch of eggs underneath a boulder. Um, this is a herring spawn. So herring are spawning right now, <laughs> same as the grunion, and they are spawning underwater, but they are spawning in areas where the, the tides will go out and expose their eggs tidally a few times uh, during the incubation period. And so there's this, these uh, seaweeds are covered with herring eggs, it's a huge, huge amount. And here's another picture of that, so you can see it's a huge amount of eggs that are produced by these herrings. Um, these are gathered by people in some areas, um, in Japan and in um, Alaska, the native people gather them for food. Um, and they're also great for, uh, of course, the animals that are eating them. It's a great resource for them as well. So, okay, so. <laughs> It is kind of tricky to come out of water. It is kind of a, an unusual thing to do with your eggs. Why are they doing it? Especially the ones that actually come out of water. Um, this is another little fish. This is a silver side, which is in the same family, not the same subfamily, but the same family as uh, the grunion. Um, so this is the Atlantic silver side on the other side of our beautiful nation. 
And they spawn in water at, low, at high tide, and then when the tide goes out, their eggs are exposed on seagrasses. Um, this is a measurement of oxygen level. So this is really low. 0.7 is like hypoxic, like there's no oxygen in the water. And the normal oxygen would be way out here. Okay? So as they're spawning, there's all this activity and all this water turning around. And they're using up all the oxygen, and there's no oxygen left. So it could be that to avoid that, they, that's one of the reasons why they're coming out of water entirely, just to get away from that situation. Maybe. <laughs> I'm going to give you one more example of, a, of an animal that spawns on, uh, with its eggs partly out of water. Um, this is the mudskipper. Mudskippers live in tropical waters. So they're really great little animals that live in a muddy mudflats. And they dig burrows. So if you think about hypoxic or low oxygen water, the mud in a mud flat is really in low oxygen. So they're digging a burrow and they're laying their eggs in there. You would think, well, there's no oxygen in there at all. And that's true. So here's what they do. They dig their burrow and they make a little J shape and they put the eggs inside here. And then they take a breath of air and they carry it down and release it. And so, <laughs> and so they're, they're creating a little air chamber for their eggs. And, not, and so that's pretty great right there. But not only that, they also, when that air gets too low in oxygen, they recognize that and they replace it and they get bring new air down and make it fresh. So <laughs> it's a wonderful, good parent. So this is at a low tide. You can see that they would come up right to the surface and they would be uh, out of water. Um, when the tide comes in, they do the opposite. It's time for them to hatch at a high tide. They will take that air out, release it. The bubbles go up. The eggs are, are uh, immersed into the water. And then they hatch and then they swim out. So not only are the parents involved in digging the burrow, but they're also keeping it nice and full of oxygen, and they're also triggering the hatching of the babies. It's a terrific thing. So this is, <laughs> I could go on and on. I won't. <laughs> um, but if you're interested, in, there is a book. <laughs> and uh, we have one in the back there. You can see it. Um, anyway, this is a, a really amazingly interesting area. But of course, the Grenin are the ones that are the best. We're so lucky. So let's go back to Grenin. How do we know where the Grenin are? Well, we do know because people like you and people like others along the coast here are Grenin greeters, right? So this is a citizen science group that we developed back in 2002 for a couple of reasons, <laughs> one of which was we were, nobody really knew how the Grenin were doing and we wanted to know more about them. So this is people who are trained to go out and uh, watch for Grenin on the right nights, send back a report, so that we know, how, know if they showed up or not, and then um, let us know what, what they saw or didn't see. We also have a hotline, 1877-GRANIAN, toll free. It's still active, feel free to call it. Uh, it does not tell you where the Grenian are. It's, you leave a message to tell us where the Grenian are, okay? <laughs> um, but here she is calling it a big run. That's Long Beach, she's at Long Beach for that. Um, all right, so let's talk about Boyd Walker. Boyd Walker is the Grenin guru. That's what he looked like. He was a professor at UCLA. Uh, he actually had retired by the time I got there to do my graduate work, but I did speak with him a few times, and he was always very gracious and very uh, full of good information about the Grenin. So when we were trying to think about how are we going to decide Grenin size of runs, we decided to name it after him because he was the one that figured out when they, when they started. Um, and, and we started this with, uh, I did this with Mike Schott and with Suzanne Lawrence Miller, who are the director, former directors of this wonderful place. Um, because back in the late 90s, I was looking at the granny runs in Malibu, and they were looking, obviously, at the granny runs here, and we were seeing really different, like some, sometimes great, sometimes not so great, and we, I just felt like we needed to have a long-term kind of record that we could keep, that we would know what was happening. So we came up with this idea of having a scale. It's kind of like the Richter scale, where it's not like you're counting the fish, but you're just kind of estimating over a fairly large area. So zero, pretty obvious. Nobody shows up, or just a few, no spawning. Um, <laughs> two would be, um, a 10 would be about 10 to 100. A two would be about up, up to 500. A three, you're starting to get into something good, several hundred to several thousand. A four, thousands of fish spawning across a wide area of the beach. That's getting pretty exciting. And then a five. <laughs> huge run, covering the beach across a wide area, and the uh, uh, run lasts for at least an hour at that peak level, at that really high level. So my picture's here, that's a zero, that's a, maybe a one, that's a two, you would get some eggs there, but not a lot, might be just in one little spot. Here's a three, it's starting to get more exciting, a four, and then there's another four, 
A four could be just look like a five, but it's only in a small area or it doesn't last all that long. Um, I wanted to point out this person here is Melissa, who's also the co-founder of the Grinding Greeters. She's been terrific about developing the program and uh, educating people about it. <laughs> and this is the five, so over an hour. If your spawning lasts for over four hours, be sure to contact a marine biologist. <laughs> Call the hotline. All right, uh, so that's a five. So we have, so you guys know that fives occur here at Cabrillo and they occur in other places as well. As well. This is one of the best places in the world to watch the grinding run. So when we have our grinding greeter trainings, we always explain to people the grinding biology, you know, here's what you're looking for, here's how you go look for a fish, right? Same as you do when you come to the programs here. They explain, here's what you're gonna see, here's how you should behave, here's all the things you should do, okay? So, um, <laughs> So we, we want everybody to know this and be able to explain it. So we have one grinding greeter here who's going to explain it. In her My name is Emily and I'm a grinding greeter. And I'm going to tell you all about how a grinding run works. First, the scouts come out, which are boys that look around to see if it's a great party. I mean, a great place to have a party. And if it is, they go out into the ocean and tell all the girls they all came flopping out in the ocean and the girls label their tails under the rock and under the sand and lay their eggs, all their eggs, and they wiggle and the boy and the boys see them wiggling, so they come over and lay beside them. Then after the party is over, the girls wiggle and hop straight out of the sand, under the sand, and then they flop back into the ocean again. And that's how a grinding run works. All right. Great. So I feel, like, I feel like she got it. I feel like she got it, okay. <laughs> Future marine biologist, right there. All right, so because of our grinding breeders, we know where the grinding are spawning. So we get reports all the way down from Tijuana all the way up to Point Conception and beyond. So we know that the grinding are spawning in the usual range right here, but we also found that they're spawning farther north. They're spawning in Monterey Bay, they're spawning in San Francisco Bay, and they're spawning all the way up in Tomales Bay, which is kind of a new thing. It's a range extension. So here's our beautiful fish that we know and love, Loressis tenuis. The first one that was ever discovered and described to name the species was found in a San Francisco fish market. <laughs> one fish, and he described a species in 1859. And then they were never seen in San Francisco Bay for another 140 years. Okay, um, San Francisco Bay is one of the most studied bodies of water there is. They trawl it all the time, they sample it all the time, so we're pretty confident that they were not there. They were not there for 140 years, and then all of a sudden they showed up. Um, they showed up in 2002, and um, what happened was warm weather. <laughs> Here's the temperature here is kind of red off the coast of our area. And look in San Francisco Bay, it's kind of warm in there. So what we think is that they, were, they caught a ride on a warm water pulse that went up north, and they got into the San Francisco Bay, and once they were there, they were like, oh, okay, it's warm here. So they were able to colonize that area. Um, <laughs> and that sounds good, except here's the problem. They, they were not as big when they colonized this area. They, they were very small. So here's the regular one. It goes across two hands. These only grow across one hand. They're, they're tiny compared to the ones we have down here. In fact, when we first saw them, we thought, these aren't mature, these aren't ready to spawn, but they were spawning. And this, they, there is a, um, if you draw a line of you know, the biggest to the smallest one, the, the biggest one of these overlaps with the ones we have down here, but the smallest one down here would not be anywhere near the smallest ones we have up there. They're, they're substantially, significantly smaller. Being smaller, you would expect that also they lay fewer eggs. So here's, you can see the 500, about 500 eggs for this one versus about 1,800 eggs for that one. So not as big, not producing as many eggs, <laughs> much smaller eggs, less yolk. They're tinier eggs as well. So maybe not as, as able to stand uh, the extra incubation time. 
Um, this is a really big run in San Francisco Bay. It's, I mean, that looks pretty good, right? But compared to the big runs down here, it's not nearly as big. So they're, they're going to be right along the tide line, and they're just going to be spawning right with the tides as the tides fall. Because again, the bay is, does not gonna have the wave-swept environment like we have down here. OK, I'm going to show you one more graph about the, these guys, because this is kind of fun. 2001 and 2 is when they first discovered, and then they actually disappeared in 2008. But we found them for two reasons. One was sampling, well, actually for three reasons. Sampling with uh, trawls, finding the fish in the trawls with the um, nets that they were doing to sample the bay, and also dropped fish from least turns. So least turns are a little bitty <laughs> bird, and they catch the little baby grunion to feed their chicks. And if they drop them, then the biologists go out and count and see what, see what the birds are eating. The so birds found the grunion as soon as they appeared, and they were able to find them as long as they were there in the bay. In fact, they found them longer than the people did. <laughs> and then they were gone. Um, we also had grunion greeters out there, and we're going to have grunion greeters out there again this year because they're back. After 2014, they came back. Um, so we're hoping they will stay for a while this time as well. All right. So. What can we do? We have, uh, this is a, I hope you realize this is a really cool animal. It's very special. It's not found anywhere else. And um, we're really fortunate to have them. <laughs> what can we do to protect them? <laughs> Good question. Okay, so we know that there are some protections already. They're what we call a managed species. A managed species means the Fish and Wildlife has some rules about them. So you guys probably know those rules, right? It's closed season right now in April and May. No take. And when there is take, there are gear restrictions, so you have to do what this young man is doing. Only your bare hands, no gear at all, to give them a little chance. Right? As you can see, that's really not that much protection if a toddler can go out and grab one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little protection. Um, <laughs> there is no, as you may not realize this, there's no bag limit for grunion. So if somebody wants to take a 1,000 of them and they can catch them, they can take them home. So people tend to take a lot of them when they do catch them. Um, I would love to see a longer close season, personally, if we could do it. I will also point out that the fish running up in the Northern California don't start running until May, and they don't peak until June and July, so they're not protected by these close season at all. Um, so that's an issue. <laughs> okay, also these eggs. Okay, this is Mission Beach in San Diego. Here's, here's the mean high tide line, here's the granite egg zone, and here's the highest high tide line. This is a major recreational beach. And again, the granite are spawning on the beaches that we have, which is mostly public beaches that are available to everybody to go out and, and hang out on. Well, one of the things that happens at a lot of our public beaches is raking. Um, sometimes this happens every single day in some, on some beaches. Okay? And you can see that there's a little bit of sand disturbance. Just a little. <laughs> As they do that, it's called mechanized beach maintenance. Um, if this is done completely all the way down to the water line, you see it, it looks kind of pleasing to the eye, but it's a little troubling because this happened the day after a grunion run. So oh, that's the end of that story for those grunion, right? Um, so what we've, what we've done, actually the reason the grunion greener started was because somebody was concerned about this. They saw this and they saw the grunion uh, eggs coming up behind the truck when they, when they raked over it and they were concerned about it. And that's one of the reasons why we started doing the grunion greener program to begin with. So now we have some changes and we call it the Grunion and Greeter Protocol, where, we, where there is still grooming. This is the same beach, Mission Beach. They're um, grooming above the high tide, but not below the high tide during the grinding season to protect that. So here's one of the beach maintenance workers to tell you about that. Right now, we're, if, if there's a tide line like this, we will generally stay um, at that line or even a, width, a bucket width behind it, um, especially on high tides in those, in those times. Well, we make sure we're not to drive into these areas down below. Those areas do have grunions in them. We've seen them. Grunion eggs, we've, se we've seen them in there in the past. So you can see that this is a um, pretty lot of sand disturbance as it goes by. Right, because that would be right over where the grunion would be. So they have been really great about it, um, and they changed their protocols because of this study that we did to show that it was harmful to the eggs. And so this person here, <laughs> this is 2004, so this is more than 10 years ago. That was me 10 years ago. Uh, this is Dennis Simmons, who was the beach manager in San Diego at the time, a great, great guy. And he totally 
you know, was very willing to change and protect the grain in that way. And then he said, we need to talk to more people about it. So we started getting together in 2004. This is at Pepperdine. So here's some of my students <laughs> and some other beach managers from various places. This is the beach manager for LA at that time. Um, and it was just 14 of us that first meeting. But over time, we decided we would incorporate. This is a meeting we had here at Cabrillo. You might recognize a few of these people. <laughs> that one and that one. Um, <laughs> so we, we incorporated it as the Beach Ecology Coalition in 2007. And we meet twice a year. And we uh, talk about balancing wildlife and protection of wildlife with the, um, with the recreation that we know everybody wants to have on our beaches. So we want to be able to share the beaches with everybody. We also meet out on the, um, in the field on beaches and talk about things that can be done, what, what different groups are doing to protect the environment and how we can improve the way we do this. Before we started doing this, nobody really talked to each other. So you could have somebody in San Diego and somebody in uh, Solana Beach, which is right next door, and they wouldn't, even, they wouldn't ever talk about these issues. And so now we have people talking across the whole coast of California um, about how to better protect the environment. And when somebody gets a good idea, then they can share it or they can test it out with other people. It's been really valuable for that. We also include um, people like uh, Fish and Wildlife, uh, Coastal Commission, um, National Marine Fishery Service, uh, state parks, all kinds of people. Aquariums, like this place, environmental groups, pretty much anybody who wants to be involved. So if anybody wants to be involved, we're going to be meeting in May in, in Santa Barbara this year. Coming up. OK, here's another big threat to Grunion and any other beach animal. That's coastal squeeze. Coastal squeeze is if the back of the beach is fixed and there we have erosion of the beach and sea level rise, the beach gets littler and littler and squeezed into uh, almost disappearing. This is Malibu. <laughs> There's not much upper beach there. This used to be an area we had Grunion runs. We obviously don't have them there anymore. There's no beach for them. So that's a big issue for here. About one third of our coastline is armored. Um, the zone, oh, I did this math. This is a little math problem for you. The zone is about three yards wide. Three yards is 0 0.0017 mile. Okay, I'm doing this in English units for you scientists, okay? okay. <laughs> There's about 300 miles of sandy beach in California. We think about our whole coast and how much of it is sandy beach. So if we multiply that number, we get a number that's less than half, of, or just a little over a half a mile square, a little bitty space. That is the entire spawning habitat for California grind, and that's it. It's all edge. It's not, it's not contiguous. It's, it's not, you know, it's broken up into little pieces. And that's smaller than Disneyland. So when I get excited about things happening to my granny, you can kind of understand why. It's just not, there's not that much room out there. Here's another thing that happened during a granny run. This is the Glow Festival <laughs> uh, in Santa Monica. I don't know if anybody here was there, but it was quite a deal. Um, this is 75,000 people on the Santa Monica Pier right there. Here's the Grenin. The Grenin actually spawned that night. Right there. <laughs> Here's me and my team keeping people off the beach during the Grenin run. <laughs> um, yeah, that was an interesting night. <laughs> but it's only one example of the kind of recreation people do on beaches. Here's another thing, though. This is a desalinization plant. This is right in the intertidal zone in Long Beach. This was a, this was a um, temporary thing, that just a demo plant. And they took it down. But the Grunion spawned right next to it, literally right next to it um, when it was there. And we tested the salinity on the eggs. And they are very vulnerable to high salinities. Um, if you think about a desal, what they do is they take seawater and make fresh water out of it. Well, that leaves a lot of salt behind, so they have to get rid of the rest of the salt. And if we put these things in a higher salinity, they, it does cause a lot of deformities and problems for them. Um, also, another issue is coastal construction like um, sand nourishment, sand replenishment. And this is done on many beaches <laughs> many times. Um, the way that that's done is, is a, a source of some concern for animals that live on the beach, or spawn on the beach especially. Um, oil spills, we had a big spill up in Refugio Beach in Santa Barbara a couple years ago. And they were in an area where the granin spawned, so we were out there digging up eggs after the granin after the uh, oil spill. Uh, I will point out that Costco Busan also was, uh, happened in San Francisco Bay, in, right in an area where we had Grenion, um, not during that season, but in the same place. So now I've told you that there's some threats. So what we get from our Grenion, um greeters is we get the Walker scale data coming back from all these different places. And so what I'm going to show you is a couple of quick graphs about that. 
so rather than giving you one, two, three, four, five, zero, <laughs> I broke it up into just three groups, small, medium, large. So small is zero, one, medium, two, three, and large is four to five. Okay, so this is from all sites, all the data we got from 2004 to 2006, about 10 years ago. Um, so you can see <laughs> large runs are pretty rare, but we have them. We have a lot of medium runs, and we have about maybe a third to maybe a little more than that of the small runs or no runs. Here's what it was 2014 to 2016 for all the sites we had reporting. Much less likely to see a run. Still see some really big runs. Still see some medium runs, but much less likely to see a run at all. Okay? You can criticize my data all you want. <laughs> you wouldn't be the first. <laughs> One of the criticisms is you could say, well, we had more people going to more places in those days than we do now, which is true. But we do have them going to a lot of the same places. So if we just take this place, Cabrillo, which we have very good data for, thanks to people like Matt and Larry and Mike that keep reporting it. I greatly appreciate that. Um, and Andres and other people that have done that for us. So this is what it was, 2004 to 2006. Look at this, look at this big run. Is this the place? This is the place, right? And this is impressive. This is great. Um, and then, here's what it was those three years, even at Cabrillo. So you probably remembered some of those nights going out there and not seeing very many fish, right? It's very disappointing. Still had some big runs. Still had some pretty medium nice runs, but a lot of nights with no runs, okay? Um, so I would say we're a little bit concerned about that. The good news is last year, so 2016 was an El Nino year. Um, last year, 2017, we had great runs. We had really good runs. And this year, we did not have any runs in March, but we had pretty nice runs. This first group in, in April, at least in a few places. So we don't know really what's going to happen. They, they definitely benefited from the El Nino. Maybe that will help overall. So what I want to just conclude with is just this idea that beaches are ecosystems. Beaches are ecosystems. It's really easy for people to realize that Tide pools are ecosystems, and kelp forests, and coral reefs are ecosystems. But beaches are also ecosystems. They have beautiful plants that you find nowhere else, things like the poppy, and the primrose, and the morning glory, that are nowhere else. They have wonderful places for animals to come in and rest and roost, like these seals and sea lions, and our wonderful little seabirds, shorebirds. And they are also really important for nurseries, for nurseries. So this is our uh, elephant seals <laughs> up in San Simeon. I'm sure a lot of you have gone up there to see them. And all the pinnipeds bring their, bring their babies up on shore. When they have their babies, they are out on sandy beaches. Um, here's a sea turtle, which we don't have around here, but one day we will. <laughs> here's a least turn. So that's a beach nesting bird. So not only just the grunion, but a lot of other animals will use the beaches as their nurseries, as their place to have their babies. Um, and so my, my goal in life at this point in time is to try to help people to realize that beaches also are ecosystems, that we need, to, we need our rec recreation on our beaches, and we love going to the beaches, but we also need to find ways to use our beaches without uh, harming the wildlife. So this is wildlife habitat. <laughs> this is a... Santa Monica Beach, the Grenadine spawn, right there. <laughs> right at the same time that you see crowds like this on the beach, that's where they are. So that's something to think about. Um, this is a quote from a former reporter for the LA Times, I really love it. When, where the sand turns wet, the wildest place on earth begins. I think everybody that works for a marine aquarium knows that's true. Um, one more thing that we've done recently is uh, develop a seashore guide. Uh, Don Erickson did this beautiful artwork uh, help with the text. So I have, um, this is available on Amazon. I have a few of these here tonight as well. Really nice little guides. This they is a, have them at the store too. you have, oh good, they have them at the store. I'm glad to hear that. Um, these, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of guides for tide pools and I have all of them, I think. <laughs> but there are very few for, in fact, this is the only one I know of that's in this format for Sandy Shores. So um, it's great. And it's being used by the teacher workshops in the Atamari Bay Aquarium as well. So that's, Neat. So I told you there's going to be a quiz. Before I give you the quiz, I was going to just acknowledge my wonderful funding sources and all the great people that we've worked with, especially the people here at Cabrillo Brain Aquarium, who's always been gracious and helpful and wonderful to work with in every possible way. So thank you for inviting me for this talk. It's a great pleasure to be here. 
And now it's time for the quiz. You guys ready? Yeah. So this is a video quiz. I work in Malibu. <laughs> um, you may have heard of a guy called James Cameron. He's made a few movies. Titanic, The Abyss, Avatar, right? Oh yeah, that guy. <laughs> He's had some success. Everybody has to start somewhere. This is his first film that he ever did. It was called The Spawning. And <laughs> it's Grunion figure prominently in it. So, as you know, sometimes when Hollywood talks about natural phenomena, they don't get it quite right. <laughs> There's a few little mistakes. So I want you to see, now that you know all the things you know about Grunion, see if you can spot if he made any little mistakes. We have some new people with us today. Perhaps you'd like to explain something about the spawning for their benefit. This sweet little fish called a grunion swims up out of the ocean onto the beach for a moment of privacy for his mating ritual. Did you see them? Did you see all those fish? One of them came so close I could have touched it. I'm trying the best way I know how to convince you that these things exist. I've seen them. Fish! It wasn't a shark, and it wasn't a barracuda, and it wasn't a moray eel, and it wasn't a jealous lover. Then what was it? I don't know. That's the point. I'm pretty damn familiar with the marine life in this area, and I don't know. But how do you know it's tomorrow night? It's always the first full moon after the spring equinox. Oh. But how the fish know? The ultimate killer organism. Grunions who could live out of water. And no one knows what forces bring them to these beaches year after year to find a mate and spawn in the dark of night. I just want to remind you that no one is allowed on the beach early. We'll scare them off if we don't wait until they're all ashore. One person can spoil it for everyone. We must call to the fish in the traditional style. We want this! 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 What's wrong with that? <laughs> Look pretty good. <laughs> um, I think we have time for questions, maybe? A couple of questions. Turn on the lights. Only you know how to do that. There we go. <laughs> so we turn on the lights so she can see you and you can see her. And I'd like to thank you for an incredible, enlightening, <laughs> I'm not sure about those grunions at the end, uh, talk. And we have a small talk. Oh, well, thank for you so you. much. Oh, that's wonderful. Sure. So thank you for your talk. I do have to share what a dynamic resource. We go out there, get the eggs, and we can hatch fish on demand. That's right. So the aquarium has done that here at the aquarium. If you haven't done a grunion hatching here, we've taken those eggs to foreign countries, France. Japan, and it's really cool. You're sitting in an audience of all these dignitaries, and up come the grunion eggs. It's like magic. It is magic. It's magic. It's magic. So thank you so much. We thank have you. some time for some questions. 
In the back. Are there Brendan runs in Manhattan Beach? Yes. Because they're planning on putting a desalination plant in there. I know. Yes, there are. There are. They're El Porto and by the pier, definitely. Um, and, and Torrance and a bunch of the Torrance beaches have them. Yes. Um, so the desal people are very aware <laughs> of our studies and our, our concerns. And Surfrider also has been taking this up with them. Um, it's, uh, yeah, they're, they're saying that they have ways to get rid of the brine that will not impact the intertidal zone. They'll have pipes that will go deeper out and out deeper water. So that's somebody else's favorite animal probably out there and that'll be affected. <sighs> yeah. Any yes. other questions? The San Francisco Brennan and ours, are they the same species? They are. When we first saw, I'm going to set this down. When, I, when we first saw them, we, they were so different in size that we thought maybe they weren't, but we did the genetic testing and they are exactly the same. They are exactly the same as the ones here and at Doheny Beach and everywhere else. Yeah. It's, it's just a really recent coloniza colonization event. So it's what we call an ecotype. They, they have a different body form, but they're the same genetically. You have a question? Are they um, uh, at recolonizing old areas in the Bay Area, or are they uh, new, new colonies? So it's an interesting thing. Um, we found them on Crown Memorial Beach, which is in East Bay um, in Alameda Island. And uh, that's where they've come back there, too. They were also at the Golden Gate um, uh, Chrissy Field, right at the, out of the mouth of the bay. And they were there as well uh, recently. Um, when they're adults, they're living just in the bay, and then when they've trawled them, they found them all over in the, in the middle bay and in the, in the deep south parts of the bay. So they've pretty much colonized the whole bay, and then it's just the problem with the bay, well, many problems with the bay. <laughs> the beaches there are all man-made, and they're very small, so to find one that has enough space for a grunting run is pretty hard. So there's very, very few places they can actually go if, they, if they're there to spawn. There's, they have to figure that out. <laughs> in advance, I think they have to check it out in advance. Do they come up on the smaller beaches around Palos Verdes, like Abalone Cove, or? They have in the past, yes, they have. Yeah, we've had granny greeters that lived in that area that were able to go down and, and check them out, yeah. I think this is still the best place to come, but I think they do show up in those places too, sometimes. So you can ask me what those fish were that were attacking people in that video. <laughs> So yeah, so it was a, it's supposed to be a genetically engineered fish that was a grunion that could come out of water and flying fish and piranhas, the <laughs> ultimate killer organism. <laughs> there it was. Those scientists, those scientists back. can't be. Yes. You know a lot about the grunion on the beach, but you know a lot about the grunion in the sea before they get to the beach. I'm glad you asked that question. Well, you said. <laughs> <laughs> we know very little about where they go when they're out in the ocean. So if you read the... Well, maybe the, the fish that we saw at the end are actually how they form when they go back. Maybe, I know. Yeah, it's possible. Then they morph back. Um, but, you know, actual grinding don't have teeth. So that's why they had to, they had to mix them with the piranhas so they would have teeth. Um, um, they, you know, the, the, the literature will tell you that they stay close to shore and they're not in very deep water. And if you go looking for them to catch them, as many of us have, um, you, if you, you have to go at a time close to a grunion run, they will be close to shore when it's close to the night when they're going to run. But otherwise, they won't be there. You can go look for them, but they won't be there. And what we think that they're maybe doing is going out deeper, maybe, um, into deeper water. Um, or they're out there in the nighttime, they're nocturnal all the time and not just when they're spawning and we just are not out at the right time to, to find them. Um, it's hard to know what they've done. They don't necessarily uh, stay in one place because obviously they moved all the way up the coast to San Francisco at some point, some of them did. So they don't necessarily stay in one place but they do have certain beaches that they really like, like Cabrillo is one of them, Malibu is one of them. So yeah, but there's, but there's, much, more, <laughs> there's much more to be learned about them. Yeah. Do they catch them in schools at all, swimming out there? Very rarely. They don't, so they don't school in the way that something like a top smelt or a sardine schools, and they all swim together, and they're ni nice, nifty, organized. So what the grunion do is they kind of mingle. Everybody kind of does their own thing, and they go back, you know, yeah. they, they're together, but they're not really swimming in a coordinated way. So, and that's when we've seen them getting ready to spawn. So 
it's probably not true. Every now and then they will come up in a, in a, in a mixed school with some of the bait fish. So some of the bait um, guys will say that they get them every now and then, uh, but they're, they're not in numbers. They're like a few that are associated with another species. You got, she's been dying to ask you a question. Okay. Um, have you looked into the increasing volume of microplastics in the hmm. land and their impact on the eggs and organisms? That's a great question. We have not. It's a great question to think about, though. Um, so as probably everybody knows, there's a lot of little bitty bits of plastic. And pretty much everywhere you go, you can find little bitty bits of plastic in the sand now, including the microfibers that come off of some of our clothes. Um, I'm hoping it doesn't impact our eggs. <laughs> That's my hope, but we haven't actually tested that. So they're really tiny. It's possible they could potentially get in. What happens when the eggs are fertilized is they get a hardened, if you feel them, if you hold them in your hand, they almost, the, the eggs themselves feel almost like plastic. They're pretty tough. And they, in the, they're in that sharp sand, and people can walk over them and, without hurting them. Um, so I think they're pretty impervious once they're full, fertilized, but before they're fertilized, or maybe at the very moment of fertilization, they would probably would be, uh, or if they're damaged, they would be potentially harmful. But that's a good question. That's a good be, that could be a future study if you'd like to do it. I, I think uh, a, one study found in high levels of microplastic in the sand, the temperature was lower. Mm -hmm. Hank Carson did that over in Camilo Beach in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that might have an effect on their on their development. He, he was well. concerned with turtles uh, right. sexing differently. Right, because turtles have environmental sex determination. So there's a recent paper about Grenin that says that they may also have at least some partial environmental sex determination. You notice that there's a lot of guys on the Grenin, <laughs> Grenin guys, um, and it's possible that the, the environment makes more males than females, even though it's not the same as uh, just a genetic or chromosomal sex determination. Okay, we got time for one more question, and then we have our little game we'll play. And then if you have further questions, I'm going to take Dr. Martin to the gift shop, and we can continue over there. So last question. So I've actually never been to a Grenian ranch. Oh. I know. Sorry. <laughs> I debated not saying that. <laughs> um, Slight coronary there. <laughs> do they come out at the same time at night? Like, do you have to be out until like four in the morning? <laughs> that actually is a great question. I get that question all the time. They're like, I want to go to the green room, but I don't want to stay up all night. I'm like, no, they don't either. So <laughs> if you get your tide chart and you look at the time of the high tide, it's a window between that time and about two hours later. If they don't show up by then, they're not coming. And if they do show up, they will come on within that window. And that's the time you want to be out, maybe a little earlier than that. That's the time you want to be out. And then after that, you can go home. You don't have to feel bad about it. <laughs> yeah, and that's a great question. experience the magic. Of yes, running. that's right. It's quite awesome. So you stand on the beach in a good run, you're barefoot, and these granules are between your toes trying to spawn. It's magic. So. <laughs>